Our sermon text for this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him does what is right, is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day to hear your word, and may we put your word into practice with our lives, now and always. Amen. Stephen, a good Presbyterian, moved into an all-Catholic community. He received a warm Christian welcome from his neighbors, but he quickly realized that he felt out of place as the only Presbyterian in this Catholic municipality. One Friday night, as he was out in his backyard barbecuing a steak, he received a visit from several neighbors telling him that Catholics don't eat meat on Fridays during Lent. After much discussion, the people in town convinced Stephen to become a Catholic. The community all came out to offer support of their new neighbor as he went from being a good Presbyterian to a devout Catholic. The ceremony was simple. The priest sprinkled Stephen with holy water and said, you were born a Protestant, you were raised a Presbyterian, and now you are a Catholic. But the next Friday, again during Lent, when the neighbors sat down to eat their fish, they could once again smell the unmistakable aroma of steak coming from next door. Again, a band of neighbors all marched into the backyard to give Stephen a lecture about what it means to be a Catholic. When they arrived at his barbecue, they saw him pouring steak sauce on his meat saying, you were born a cow, you were raised as beef, and now you are a fish. <laughs> now, just so you know, because I don't wish to offend, just so you know, after the Good Friday service on Friday, I told two Monsignors that joke and got permission from them to tell it to me today. To no offense is made. Christians come in all shapes and all sizes and all denominations. And sometimes we vary in our practices and beliefs, but one thing we all agree on, today is the most glorious of days. Today Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. 
I think the thing that makes Easter so special is that it's a day filled with hope. Hope, and more specifically, hope in God, is one of the best tools that we possess in today's world. Let me try and explain why. Now, I am fairly certain that most everyone here has watched at least one James Bond or a superhero movie. I love them. I love the science fiction of it. I love the superhero-ness of it. Now, in the plot lines of these films, there is always an evil scientist. They're usually a doctor. You know what that? that there's always an evil scientist or a super villain, and they have this ingenious plan to destroy humanity and control the world. The devised method of destruction is usually well thought out and very elaborate, poisoning the water supply, creating a way to travel back in time and change history, thereby changing our present and controlling the world. They bring the world to its knees by taking over all the banks and financial institutions. They create a virus that will wipe out all computer systems, or one that will wipe out all of us. And most of the time, the diabolical plan involves a new weapon or technology designed at blowing us all to kingdom come. The villains always seem to go to extraordinary lengths in order to cause great harm to the human race. That sounds like a lot of work and effort to me. Now, if I were an evil mastermind determined to rule the world, and I'm not, but if I were, I would make it simple. I would destroy the world by taking away hope. If you take away hope, you take away faith and love. If people lose their ability to hope, then what becomes prevalent is emptiness and despair. If there is no hope, there is no desire to move forward. If there is no hope, there is no wishing for a better day, no looking for that silver lining or a dawn to take away our darkness. If there is no hope, there is no tomorrow. Now, on that first Good Friday, the air must have been thick with the tension of despair and hopelessness. Standing out in the open air, looking up on the hill of Golgotha, witnessing Jesus nailed to a tree, sandwiched between two criminals, watching him die a slow and painful death, and then placing his lifeless body in a tomb. On that fateful Good Friday, it must have felt as if all hope was lost, that hope was ripped from the air. But just three days later, it was discovered that the tomb was empty, and Jesus was in fact alive. God's love and forgiveness and grace of Christ has renewed our relationship with God. That action alone brings hope to the world. And Christ continues to bring hope to the world, continues to bring hope to our very lives. And although it's not actually mentioned, we can see in today's text that Peter had that sense of hope when he began. The text begins that Leland read by saying he began to speak to them. This takes place in the 10th chapter of Acts, and this is better known as the story of Peter and Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman soldier who was stationed with the other troops in the town of Caesarea on the northern coast of Samaria. Prompted by a vision of an angel who has urged him to summon Peter, Cornelius sends two of his servants to fetch the apostles. Now, at the same time, Peter had been given a strange vision of a great sheet being let down from heaven, filled with unclean animals, and he was commanded by the Lord to eat what was unclean. In other words, Peter's vision conveyed that the good news of the gospel is not only for ritually pure Jews or for the faithful of Israel, but for all people everywhere. That is hope. That is the realization that brings Peter to Cornelius' house. And while he was with him, he gives this bare synopsis of Jesus' story and presents the very heart of the gospel. So let's highlight some of the things that Peter talks about today. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now, there is hope in this sentence because it shows us that we have a loving God. 
Jesus' sacrifice wasn't some desperate act or something to appease an angry or vengeful God. It was part of an integral plan. And each detail was carefully prearranged by a God who loves each of us with all of his heart. In Christ there is hope because we come from a God of love. Scripture also states that he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. In Jesus there is hope because we have a God who heals our pain, a God who enters into our darkness, a God who is with us in our suffering. Peter states they put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. The crucifixion shows the ugliness, shows the sin, shows the separation between God and humanity. The resurrection shows that God cannot be defeated, that sin does not rule the day, that hatred and anger are never a match for forgiveness and mercy. Jesus brought hope to the world by conquering sin and death. Jesus brought hope to the world with forgiveness. Jesus brought hope to the world because his sacrifice created a new relationship between us and God. Jesus brought hope to the world by showing that God is a God of love. And hope and love are intertwined. We are able to never lose hope because of what we gain in love. Love is strong and gentle and kind. Love seeks forgiveness. Love is about respect and giving each other the benefit of the doubt. Love does not tear people apart, it brings them together. Love does not conquer, it forgives. Love does not control, it accepts. Love is not about power, it about, it's about freedom. Easter is a glorious day because God's love instills a hope that can never be taken away. Now, this story I got from the Sermon Central, there are lots of websites out there that are dear to ministers and people of faith. Sermon Central and Sermons.com and Sermon this and that. And they're wonderful tools. You have to pay for them. But they're, but they're wonderful tools. And this story comes from one such site. There was a monastery that was settled up in the mountains by a forest in in some majestic, beautiful community. The monastery had been there for generations, for hundreds of years, but it was dwindling. It was dying off the, the, it just wasn't the same as it used to be. Society wasn't the same, how people thought of monks and monasteries. It was just dwindling. And there was only five monks left and they were all getting up in age. I'm not going to say the age, but they were all getting up in age. There was a, a head monk or an abbot and four other monks. And they, they knew that the monastery was in trouble. Now, near the monastery was a cottage, because this was in a picturesque, scenic area. And in the cottage from time to time, there was a, there was a local minister who would come and use the cottage to, to meditate, to write sermons together. And over the years, the minister and the abbot had become very good friends. And so the, the, the abbot noticed that the minister was at and using the cottage. So he went to speak to him, went to speak to him, went to commiserate with them because they were friends. And he said, that the monastery is dying. We're not, we don't have much time left. It's, it's, it's going to go away. Is there, is there anything you can do, any advice you can give, anything you know of that could help? And the minister said, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't know of anything. And unfortunately, it's kind of the same everywhere. Religion's not what it used to be. Churches aren't filled like before. And it's not just your monastery, but that's the way it is. And there's nothing I don't know how to help. So they talked a while, commiserated a while, were together a while. And as they were leaving, the abbot said, you're sure you can't think of anything? He said, the only thing I can tell you is that the Messiah is among you. The Messiah is one of you. So 
the abbot took this back, went back to the monastery, and the monks all said, what did the minister say? Is there anything we can do? And he said, no. He said he didn't know. All he said was this very cryptic message that said, the Messiah is among you, the, the Messiah is one of you. And he didn't know what that meant. The Messiah is among you on earth, uh, in the community, in the monastery. Uh, he's, he's, he's hiding in a bush, he's one of us. We, we don't know what it means. So the monks started thinking about this, each one of them contemplating of, of what that could mean. And, and they thought maybe he meant that, that the Messiah is one of the monks, that is actually in the monastery. He probably meant the abbot, you know, because he's been here the longest generations. He's definitely our leader. Maybe, maybe he's the Messiah. Or maybe they meant Brother Philip because he's the kindest one of us all. He's, he's, he's always there with a listening ear and he's always by our side. Maybe it's Philip who's the Messiah among us. Or, or, or maybe it's Brother, but well, maybe it's 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 Brother John. He's he's kind of overlooked because he's he's so quiet and so meek and mild. Wouldn't think it's him, but, but Jesus was meek, so maybe he's the Messiah. Well, it's it's not it's not Brother Edmund, that's for sure, because he's so wrong. It couldn't be him. But you know, he's always right, and he's always got the right thing to say even though he's a bit of a grump. And it certainly couldn't be me as the only other monk left. I mean, could it? And so each of the monks started thinking along these lines. And, and then they still went about their business of being monks in the monastery. But they were a little bit kinder to each other and a little bit nicer to each other, just in case one of them just happened to be the Messiah among them. And as I said before, this monastery was situated in the picturesque part of the country. People would come to the forests nearby, and people would come to the grounds on the seminary, and they would have picnic lunches, and they would take walks on the seminary grounds, even though they didn't use the monastery for its purpose. And they began to notice that there was a change in these five monks. The whole town knew that this monastery was about to close. It wasn't a secret. But these five monks were going around as if it would never close, as if this was a thriving, loving, great place. So they must know something that the rest of the town didn't. And, and the way they acted and behaved kind of was contagious. And people started noticing. There was, a, there was an aura of confidence about these monks. There was a sense of privilege, of kindness, of love with the way they went about things. They were living as if they were people who had an amazing amount of hope. And so it started bringing more and more people to the grounds to see the example and the behavior of these men. And more and more people came and more and more people walked the grounds and used the monastery to pray and went inside because of this feeling of hope that was coming from what was now becoming a very special place. And, and young men started coming to the monastery and started seeing the example of the monks. And one decided to join, and then another, and then another. And in a few years, this monastery became the whole talk of the area. People, when they vacationed, would come there because it was such a place of love and giving and hope, and it was such a feeling of confidence and such an aura of mercy and grace when you walked in the grounds. And so it became that thriving place that it used to be, all because of the minister said, the Messiah may be among you. And that's what Easter is for us. It shows us that hope of God. It shows us that promise that never goes away. It shows us that faith and that hope that we have that Jesus is among us. And the Messiah is not only among us. We believe in that living presence that is in and through and about us. And so we can have that hope that really can't take anything away from us. As long as we know and believe that Christ is risen, He is risen indeed. Let us pray.
gracious God, be with us as we today celebrate and live out your message of hope and love and eternal life. And be with us each day as we try to live that now and always.